All right. Well, I'm excited to start out this uh, luncheon plenary. Uh, this is uh, the cleaning up the planet with technology session. My name is Umar Bardwaj. I'm the CHCI Microsoft Environmental Innovation Graduate Fellow. Nice, short and sweet title I have there. And uh, this session is near and dear to my heart for sure. I'm a recovering engineer myself. I, I did chemical engineering in undergrad and did a lot of thinking about sustainable energy technologies. Now I've moved more into the policy space on sustainable energy, but um, we definitely continue to see how central the technologies that will help to reduce emissions and improve our society's environmental stewardship are, are so yeah, important to, to the way that we address the climate and environmental crisis. So on behalf of uh, CHCI, I'd like to thank first uh, Cox, HP Inc., General Motors, CTIA, and ServiceNow for their generous support of this session. Fighting climate change has been called this generation's most pressing challenge. New technologies are an essential part of our nation's toolkit in combating climate change, and estimates have predicted that roughly one and a half to two trillion dollars of global capital could be invested in green technologies every year for the next three years. We'll hear from a panel today of distinguished experts who are tackling this very issue and will share their plans for cleaning up the planet and fighting climate change. To kick off our session, it's my honor to introduce the session chair, Congresswoman Annette Diaz Paragan, who will be uh, joining us via video. She's the first Latina ever to represent California's 44th Congressional District. In the late 1990s, Congresswoman Paragan began her career in public service coordinating outreach efforts for African Americans in the Office of the Public Liaison for the Clinton White House, and worked for the NAACP, focusing on racial health disparities and discrimination. A strong advocate for environmental justice, Congresswoman Barragan successfully stood up to a powerful oil company and stopped a proposal to drill 34 oil and water injection wells in Hermosa Beach and out in the Santa Monica Bay. She's vice chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and a member of the Progressive Caucus. She also serves on the House Committee on Homeland Security and serves on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, we are, which is where I'm at right now. So it's uh, good to have her joining us, at least virtually. She couldn't be here in person due to Congresswoman duties, but she's provided us with her recorded welcome remarks. So we will have that uh, playing now. Good afternoon and welcome to this year's CHCI Tech Summit. I'm Congresswoman Annette Barragan, and I also serve as the current chair of CHCI. I'm excited to kick off our climate change panel on cleaning up the planet with technology today. I just returned from Egypt in COP27, where I had the opportunity to join Speaker Pelosi and my colleagues as part of a congressional delegation to the United Nations Annual Climate Change Conference. It was a great opportunity to engage and take part in this annual conference where countries work together to reduce emissions and address climate impacts. Bottom line, America is all in to fight the climate crisis. With the Inflation Reduction Act, we are accelerating our transition to the clean energy future. To get there at the speed and scale necessary, we need the business community to be all in with us. We need your partnership to build the electric vehicles, the smart microgrids to integrate wind and solar with battery storage, and to innovate and continue to lower the cost of clean energy. As we all work on technological solutions, it's critical to put equity at the heart of our work and ensure Latino communities and other minority communities are at the table and that their unique challenges and lack of capital are addressed. Our communities hit first and worst by climate change need to be at the front of the line for the investments, the jobs of the future, and the STEM education opportunities to innovate within your companies. Thank you to the business leaders on this panel today for sharing your vision for how to equitably align your company's investments and innovation efforts with the clean energy future. I look forward to our continued partnership so we can make meaningful progress to address the climate crisis through technology. Again, we must all strive to center equity in opportunity and delivery in this work and make it a priority to provide opportunities for the next generation of Latinos and Latinas. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Congresswoman. It's now my pleasure to introduce welcoming, welcoming remarks from Bob Jimenez, Senior Vice President for Corporate Affairs at Cox Enterprises. He's responsible for leading internal and external communications, digital platforms, public affairs and issues management, ESG engagement, measurement and reporting, and corporate philanthropy. Mr. Jimenez serves on the boards of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, the Planck Center for Leadership in Public Relations, and the Woodruff Arts Center. Please welcome Bob Jimenez. Thank you, Amar. I appreciate that. Buenas tardes. All right, all right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Cox Enterprises is proud to sponsor this event for many reasons, but especially because of CHCI's dedication to preparing the next generation of Latino leaders. Specifically, this panel, Cleaning Up the Planet with Technology, aligns perfectly with many of the strategies and goals we have for our businesses. Um, Cox is a purpose-driven private company led by our chairman and CEO, Alex Taylor. Alex is fourth generation uh, leader uh, of the Cox family to lead our company. Uh, and next August, we'll be celebrating our 125th anniversary. Our major brands include broadband and cable TV company, Cox Communications, and some automotive services groups like Auto Trader and Kelly Blue Book. Cox is always thinking about the future. And a big part of that is ensuring that our young people inherit a world with an environment that is clean, beautiful, and can be enjoyed well into the future. Cox formalized our commitment to the environment back in 2007 with the creation of our Cox Conserves program. Today, this program has three goals, is to send zero waste to landfill by 2024 and to be both carbon and water neutral by 2034. And our zero waste to, to landfill goal is right around the corner. We're looking forward to reaching that milestone. Our dedication to the environment is ingrained throughout our businesses and is a big part of future plans at our company. That's one of the reasons we launched Cox Clean Tech. It's an emerging business unit focused on acquiring and growing sustainable companies and technologies. Our investments in this area include Nexus Circular, which is an advanced recycling company, and controlled environment agriculture businesses like Bright Farms and Muchi Farms. We're also working to take charge of the electric vehicle battery life cycle. As EVs become more popular, we need to find efficient and sustainable solutions to effectively extend battery life and to keep batteries out of landfills and out of the oceans. Our investment in the company Spears New Technologies is helping us do just that. All told, since 2007, we've invested more than $1 billion in sustainable businesses and technologies, and that number continues to grow. And finally, we know to achieve our ambitious goals, we must also continue to invest in the next generation of leaders. Cox Communications is committed to ensuring all K through 12 students have the access and skill sets needed to succeed in an increasingly digital first world. That's why we're working with the Boys and Girls Clubs of America to provide innovation labs across our communities and provide discounted broadband offerings. We know our company won't be able to solve our environmental challenges alone, but we hope we can do our part and play a role and serve as a role model for others to follow. We are proud to sponsor this event. I'm just as interested as you are to hear what our uh, panel has to say in terms of their solutions to appro approach climate change. And in the past, if the past has taught us anything, it's that when people and governments and businesses come together, we can accomplish great things. I know we have our work cut out for us, but I know we can do this and I'm really looking forward to seeing our successes. Enjoy. Mic 
stakes a lot higher up than it was before I, <laughs> Bob came up. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. All right, now let's begin our conversation, what you've all been waiting for. To facilitate this panel that we have here today, we're delighted to have Umer Irfan as our moderator for the session. Mr. Irfan is a senior com correspondent at Vox, writing about climate change, COVID-19, and energy policy. He's a regular contributor to the radio program Science Friday. Prior to Vox, he was a reporter for Climate Wire at END News. He's also an incredible photographer. Please welcome our moderator, Umer Irfan. Uh, thank you, Omar. Thank you, Bob. And congratulations to Congresswoman Barragan on re-election. And thank you all for being here. Uh, and thanks to the Congressional Caucus Institute for putting together this. Uh, a lot of gratitude to go around. And I am definitely honored to be on this panel with uh, such esteemed panelists. Uh, to begin with, to my immediate right is Julia Kumo, representing Kiel HP. And then we have uh, Nicole Reynolds, who's been re who is representing ServiceNow. And to the far end, we have Noel Perez representing GM. Uh, all of their bios you should have in your uh, programs as well. They're all long, very well esteemed, and you should recognize them as well. Uh, but I think we can jump right into this. Uh, as Congresswoman Barragan said, that she was just at COP27. This is this big international meeting where countries from around the world are hammering out the details on climate change. And this year's meeting is focusing a lot on money, not just investing on how to deal with climate change, but also compensating some of the countries that are facing the effects of climate change right now. President Joe Biden was there just last week saying that the United States is going to put its money where its mouth is. So that's the government. I'm kind of interested in hearing now the private sector. How are you putting the money where your mouth is? And I'll start with you, Julia. Great. Well, thank you all for being here. And I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to speak on this panel and for CHCI for putting this together. Um, I think COP re represents a great opportunity for both the public and private sector to come together and really benchmark progress and um, create new initiatives, new research around data science that is um, inclusive and uh, towards a resilient future. So we had a, so when we think of sustainability and specifically climate action at HP, we have three goals. And one of the goals is around forests. We're the world's largest printing company. So we have a goal. We've already achieved zero deforestation in our HP branded papers. So when you go to a Staples or you go to purchase um, HP branded paper, that's already certi uh, certified recyclable. So we purchased that through the Ford Stewardship Council. We're trying to go one step further and ensure, ensure that any page of printer paper, regardless of the brand that goes through our printers, is reforested. So we were at COP with the World Wildlife Fund, which is a huge global nonprofit, environmental nonprofit, and we announced, um, well, we already have an $80 million partnership with them to restore, protect, and responsibly manage forests. But we announced an extension of this and are working to reforest, responsibly manage, and protect forests in Peru, Brazil, and Australia. So that's just one example of where we're trying to put our money where our mouth is. Um, Amir, thank you. Um, Nicole Francis Reynolds, head of global government relations for ServiceNow, and um, we also are thankful to Chairwoman Baragon um, and our colleagues at ServiceNow, and Larry Gonzalez uh, from the Raven Group, who is an amazing uh, representative of ServiceNow as a consultant um, for helping us create this partnership and uh, for being here today. Um, look, we know that public-private partnerships are critically important, um, and companies have to embed um, their IT strategy into their business strategy. Um, and that includes um, monitoring um, you know, their carbon emissions. And we have made several commitments. And one is to get to net zero by 2030. Um, the second is to ensure that our facilities, um, that means our offices, our um, just data centers all run on electricity, and which we're proud to say that they are doing that now, and we reached that goal in 2021. Um, another goal of ours is to use our platform for good, um, for helping governments and um, other companies, which are customers of ours. We, our platform is used by over 80% of Fortune uh, 500 companies, and we want to help companies and governments track um, their performance. Um, when it comes to ESG. So, um, and then finally, just helping this next generation of workers 
um, and which includes students, um, prepare for um, these 21st century jobs, which is understanding what ESG means, understanding how to leverage technology by building on platforms and helping, again, helping companies and governments um, modernize, um, which means, you know, helping our planet. So those are some of the ways that we are helping move our, our, our world forward. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, hey, everyone. Noel Perez. Uh, I just want to start off in saying uh, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I am a Mexican-American and uh, all the way from California. And it's always great to, to see folks in our community um, have these opportunities where we can talk about technology and how we can fully integrate ourselves uh, in this 21st century when it comes to jobs and when it comes to just living a better life. So. Uh, uh, you know, my parents come from Zacatecas, uh, Mexico, so it's always a delight to see folks like you all in this room. Uh, and to keep it short and sweet, to answer your question, $35 billion by 2025. So that's how much we're investing in clean energy technology when it comes to EVs and AVs. And folks might be thinking, well, what's a what's billion dollars? No one really has this concept of a billion dollars. Uh, but as you all were, uh, are aware, everything costs a lot of money. And uh, just to give you some examples, we announced we are uh, working on uh, battery plants. And these battery plants are costing uh, over $2 billion each. Uh, we have one up and running in Tennessee, next year in Ohio, following year in Michigan, and we yet to announce another one. But each one is about $2.2 billion. So it just kind of shows you the infrastructure that's needed really get this going and really make an impact. Great. And what's kind of interesting with the panelists here is all of you are kind of operating on different time scales, right? You've got a software company that iterates very quickly, then you have a tech company that maybe iterates on two years, and then you have a, you know, an automotive company that's got three to five, maybe decade-long time scales. And for a problem like climate change, you need to keep your eye on the ball for decades, if not longer. So I'm curious, Nicole, like for a company like yours that like has to iterate so quickly on the technology front, how do you keep your eye on the ball? Um, by just keeping my eye on, our eyes on the ball. Um, okay. <laughs> well, you, you have to, you have to, it's funny, I tell my son that all the time when he's playing <laughs> baseball, um, keep your eye on the ball. Um, no, you have to be, you have to have, you know, emotional IQ, right? EQ. Um, you have to be in tune with your customers. And again, that includes businesses, um, governments, and, and your communities. And so we have to know what, and I also have to underscore the importance of harmonization. There are so many policies and regulations that are being proposed right around the world. And so the governance piece when we talk about ESG is really important. So understanding what the, what the rules of the road are. Also being at the table when these rules are promulgated so that you're advocating for your companies, governments, and communities. You know, as you mentioned, um, electric vehicles and charging stations, making sure that these charging stations are in all communities, right? Not just certain communities, but all of them, and understanding what technology might be needed to operate those charging stations. And from the company's perspective that, that manages those charging stations, having some sort of ESG command center to understand you know, what's being saved, um, what's, what, what are the CO2 emissions. Um, and, and so it's just being in touch with your your customer base and, and, again, in your communities so that you know what's needed. This, you know, I forgot the stat about, like, how many apps will be needed over the next five to ten years. It's several million. Um, and, and so, and why is that? Because we know that the, the economy is changing, needs are changing, and so having a nimble platform like ours, which is called the Now platform, is really important so that you can build apps on it and you need the people to build it. So that makes sense if you're pitching that to your customers, but what about your shareholders or your board members? Like, you know, if you have quarterly earnings and you have to, like, um, you know, be accountable for that, like, how do you make a long-term investment that's not going to pay dividends for a while, you know, palatable right now? Like, how do you convince this as a, make the business case for investing in long-term thinking? 
Um, well, first of all, you know, many of us are shareholders, right? If you think about what your 401ks are invested in and if you're diversifying those, um, if you are looking at your just your pension, um, we are all shareholders to some degree. And so we should have a voice and a seat at the table um, and, be, and, and become more aware of the earnings calls when they take place with these companies that you're investing your dollars in. And, and so, but the changes are happening rapidly. There will be some metrics that we won't see for the next 5, 10, 15 years. But we're also seeing metrics now. Um, again, with these global rules, we're, we're having to meet goals now. Companies are making these commitments. They have goals. Um, and so we are, our technology is helping them track those goals now. And we're reporting that back um, in our global reports that come out every year. Uh, and, and that's how you do it. We, this is happening now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that brings to mind that uh, California recently announced that they're going to ban the sale of fossil fuel cars by 2035. That seems like a very definite goalpost, and I'm just kind of wondering, Noel, how does your company start, uh, you know, racing for that finish line now? Yeah, so uh, Mary Barra, our our CEO at General Motors, uh, first and only woman CEO of a car company in history, Uh, she's she's been very uh, consistent with... um, with when it comes to uh, her goals, when it comes to going all electric by 2035. So we are very much aligned with um, what states are doing, as you mentioned, uh, on the West Coast and uh, President Biden, his recent announcement as well. But this all started for us many years ago. Um, you know, she made the announcement um, uh, uh, early last year about going all electric. And we're on track, um, you know, it's important. And, and just to, to mention, um, you know, your, your, your question on um, keeping, making sure we're consistent, you know, Mary Barr also recently mentioned that our senior leadership team, uh, their bonus structure will be directly tied to how many EVs. And Julia, your industry, I mean, HP as a company is not just on the commercial products that, you know, people know and buy, but also on the back end with server solutions and things like that. And this is all a That's really... HP. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, so, but like, it's a very competitive space. Like, so how do you compete while also keeping like environmental goals in mind? Yeah, and I, I think this is something that a theme I've seen across all of our responses. We've set these goals with time horizons at 2030, 2040. All of, not only our companies, but all, a lot of the industry, whether it's tech, whether it's cars, uh, anything like that, have set these time horizon goals. So, we are beholden to putting out these public statements, not only having our customers hold us accountable, but also our investors and um, the industry at large. So you need to put out these goals really in order to compete because there are people out there, the customers, who are really pushing companies to really start caring about what they're doing and their, set, and their impact on the world. So that's the only way you're able to compete, I think. And Nicole, you brought up policy and You know, for a long time, businesses in general and some of the more industrial heavy businesses in particular have been kind of wary about regulations around climate change and around the environment. Some of them have outright opposed them. And now it seems like the hot new thing are these environmental and service goals and all these kinds of investor criteria about factoring in the environment. I'm curious, you know, how, why has that kind of thinking changed and and what kinds of policies are you hoping to see in the future that sort of align the environment with your business goals? That's a, that's a good question. Um, and I, I go back to the importance of having a seat at the table. Um, I'm thankful for the role that I have at ServiceNow because it does give us, um, give me the opportunity to um, hire amazing staff and, a, and an amazing um, government um, relations consultant um, that reflects America and re- reflects the world. Um, and, and because of that, we can hear um, the feedback that policymakers, um, you know, the sentiments that they have about what's happening. And we have the opportunity to educate them about what's really happening on the ground um, so that they truly understand how, this, how these policies will impact communities around the world, how it will impact um, companies, how it will impact their own jurisdictions that they represent. Um, and so when that's done, when that takes place, then you can have some semblance of policies that can actually be implemented and adhered to. 
Um, in the absence of bipartisanship, which we know, you know, unfortunately exists right now in this climate, um, in the absence of, you know, some policymakers that may be out of touch with the community, it's hard to achieve that. Um, and then you add on just global, um, you know, policies that are being implemented or proposed around the world. We need harmonization because otherwise what we will see is um, companies having to adhere to all sorts of um, policies. It, it becomes like a game of whack-a-mole and you have to hire lots of compliance attorneys. You have to hire lots of um, you know, lobbyists and government um, relations um, executives, which there's nothing wrong with hiring, right? But you want to streamline um, these, these policies so that everyone can adhere to them. Um, in the absence of that, it just makes things much more complex, which is what we're seeing now. Is there an example that sort of stands out to your mind where you educated someone or you corrected a misconception that was beneficial for everybody? Sure, there, there are lots of examples. You, you take, take privacy law, right, okay. which is critically important to all of us. How many pop-ups do we see on our phones? Or, how, you know, if you're talking to someone just, say, right now, and you mention a clothing store, and all of a sudden you get, you know, an app for that particular clothing store. Privacy is important. Or, you know, when I used to work at MasterCard, data breach and notification is really important. And, and now, you know, platforms, understanding technology and the benefits that it has. Um, there are lots of examples of um, how... It's just so important that we educate ourselves, uh, make sure that we educate policymakers, because you can't know everything, right? And, and so that's the strength of all of us and the relationships that we have and making sure that we're on top of, of what's going on. Julia? Yeah, I was just going to add, I think as a multinational company, we, and you touched on this a little bit, just the need for predictability and commonality across jurisdictions. Um, I think one example could be just definitions, especially when it comes to climate change, is for clear definitions on scope one, two, and three emissions across jurisdictions. Um, could you explain what that is, scope one, two, and three? <laughs> yes, exactly. So scope one is the emissions that are directly associated with your company's use. Scope two is the emissions that you are purchasing, and scope three is basically everything else. And as a reporter, can you can you vouch for that one? <laughs> that <sounds laughs> I think right, I, yes. I made it a little easy. Um, but so that would be an example of um, in, of common definitions across jurisdictions, even common carbon tax across jurisdictions, um, things that HP does support, um, as well as mandatory disclosures of a, of greenhouse gas emissions or types of policies that we're seeing across jurisdictions that really vary, um, vary depending on the country that you're operating in. Mm -hmm. And while Nicole mentioned, you know, uh, working in a political environment where, you know, we aren't going to see much bipartisan cooperation, and we've seen this sort of aggressive ping-ponging back and forth between the Trump administration and the Biden administration. The Trump administration wanted to relax vehicle emissions rules, and now the Biden administration ratcheted them back up. Uh, you know, how do you operate in that kind of environment, and do you push for a specific policy that can perhaps be palatable to both sides? I think overall, we always think about what's the right thing to do. Um, I think our, our leadership has been very consistent as of late. But overall, you know, when we look at this past Congress, we passed uh, two pieces of legislation that was bipartisan, that was two big priorities for general. And the first one was last year, which was the Infrastructure uh, Act, uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, and where we were able to secure $7.5 in EV charging. And as you mentioned just earlier, uh, making sure that regardless of where you live, uh, you have access to this infrastructure from multi-housing units to highways to inner cities to rural. That is extremely important, especially for, for our communities. You know, uh, now we're at 70% of Latinos actually live in the suburbs, uh, a 10% increase in over 30 years, and potentially that can be increasing. So it's important not everyone can charge their vehicle in their home. 90% um, of all folks charging their vehicles do it at their, at their house in their garage. But it's important as where we have our Latinos uh, that that is accessible for, for everyone. And staying with you, Noel, uh, the auto industry, more than just about any other industry, can shape the demand from its customers. Like they, they, People take a lot of cues from the automakers as to what's cool, what's hot, what kinds of things they should want. So how do you get your customers to want what's better for the environment? Look, at the end of the day, we give the customers what they want. <laughs> um, 
you know, folks are, are you know, mentioning, it's like, hey, what happened to, you know, the Chevy Avalanche? It's like, well, it stopped selling, so we stopped producing it. Um, or the, the Chevy Impala. So we adapt. I think we've seen a trend where everyone now has a crossover, an SUV. And uh, that's just the reality of, of what the population wants. At the end of the day, when we start thinking about electric vehicles and how can we get Latinos to adopt electric vehicles, I look at it as a, as a three-step approach. Uh, number one is affordability, and we're able to do that with uh, with IJA, um, sorry, with IRA, with EV consumer tax credits, where you can get $4,000 uh, for a used EV or $7,500 for a new EV. Our lowest EV currently on the market is a Chevy Bolt that runs you at $26,500. So it's the most affordable EV. Next year, we're releasing something a little bigger uh, that is the Equinox for $30,000. So number one is affordability. I just touched on number two, which is easy infrastructure, making sure you have access. And number three is uh, brand recognition. Number one sold vehicle to Latinos in the U.S. is the Chevy Silverado. It's a beautiful truck. I'm sure you've been in one. And um, so look, we are producing a Silverado EV spring 2023 for $42,000, which is very comparable uh, to what the the regular Silverado um, is sold at. So we feel that not just those three approaches, but also making sure our community is well aware and we're able to communicate with our community about the importance of EVs, uh, making sure, talking about the carbon emissions and how it affects our health as we live in these inner cities or, or, or whichever you know, area you might live in. So uh, that's important as well. When can I get an electric Camaro? <laughs> so the Camaro, uh, we're, we're definitely going to do, uh, next year we're releasing the Corvette. And um, uh, we don't produce any hybrids, but 2023 we're doing a Corvette that's hybrid. And then shortly after that we're doing an all-electric Corvette. So soon enough. And for both uh, Nicole and Julia, you know, tech companies, we don't typically associate directly with greenhouse gas emissions. But as more of our lives become digital and more of our activity gets shifted to the cloud, there's a larger and larger back end that I think a lot of people don't appreciate. The server farms and all the computing infrastructure that's necessary to keep running this is having a larger environmental footprint. And I'm kind of curious, what efforts are you guys making to try to curb that? Nicole? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, so I would say our, our two major environmental effects at HP are our carbon footprint and our products. So tackling products first, we have a goal to achieve 75% circularity in our products and packaging. What does circularity mean? So the use of recycled content, recycled plastic, things like that. So we are 40% of the way there. Last year, 164 of 166 of our PCs and displays that were put online had some sort of recycled content in them. So we're really trying to ensure that our products have some sort of circular economy principles embedded in them, but also we're driving the energy efficiency of our products. So that kind of goes to our carbon footprint. Um, So at HP, 70% of our carbon greenhouse gas emissions are associated with our supply chain and 30% with our customer use. So we're tackling the customer use by really driving up that energy efficiency and supporting clean energy deployment like the provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act that um, will help make it so when our customers plug in our products into their homes, they're able to tap in um, clean electricity from the grid. And then when it comes to our supply chain, we're working directly with our suppliers to really incentivize and educate them on how to bring their greenhouse gas emissions down and set science-based targets and just working directly with them. So. And as I mentioned earlier, all of our data centers and our offices run on 100% renewable electricity, um, which we're proud of. And uh, and as we talked about policies, um, data centers are, data localization has become yet another area um, that is just pop, those policies are popping up around the world. And so as we continue to invest by creating more data centers to protect privacy uh, around the world, um, those data centers will also be 100, run on 100% renewable electricity. 
And as we know, innovation isn't just limited to technology. I mean, things like different business models and maybe different financing models to make the better options more accessible to your customers um, is another place where I think we're seeing a lot of innovation. I'm kind of curious if you have any other kinds of programs like that. I'll start with you, Noel. Yes, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, at General Motors, uh, we believe uh, the future is also autonomous. And every autonomous vehicle will be an electric vehicle. We have Cruise. Um, automotive is an AV company based out of San Francisco. Um, this company has um, a taxi service in SF where you can download the Cruise app and you can pay to get from point A to point B. No one driving behind the vehicle. It's fully autonomous. Um, and it works in the majority of San Francisco. And uh, this just started this year, and it is a huge breakthrough. Um, and if you don't live in San Francisco, which I'm assuming uh, most of you don't, I, uh, we're expanding to Austin, Texas, and Phoenix, Arizona by the end of this year. So we are very excited about this new technology, and we feel that it is going to be very helpful to the uh, my mother does not drive. She's in her 60s. Uh, she just never picked up driving. And I was just on the phone with her, and uh, there was going to be a, 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 about diesel. And she was uh, very excited to go. And uh, two of my siblings live near her. And she asked both of them, and unfortunately, they couldn't give her a ride. And uh, the distance was quite far. And I said, Mom, I will call an Uber for you. And she's like, I don't feel comfortable being in a car with another stranger. So, you know, unfortunately, she missed out on this great opportunity to be with her brothers and sisters and her um, you know, nephews and nieces. And something like an AV, which one day we will be able to sell to individual customers as well, can be a, a piece of, of the solution to making sure families. What about you, Julia? What is uh, HP working on that's maybe non-technology innovations? Not in technology innovation. So I really think this goes back to some of our forestry goals. Um, and we've seen the huge announcement, nature-based climate solutions at COP. So I think really heavily investing there, because it is such a big part of this climate change conversation, it is ensuring that we have a world that is biodiverse for uh, future generations coming, coming after us. And then also working with indigenous groups on the ground to provide them well-paying jobs and also educational opportunities. So while not necessarily in technology, I do think it's a, a part of the conversation. What about you, Nicole? Uh, things that are changing in your approach that aren't necessarily, you know, the whiz bang gadgets. Sure. Um, we have a competition um, where we invest in small and medium-sized businesses. Also, um, just kind of... Uh, kind of serving as an incubator. And there is a company that we supported about a year or two ago um, that um, services these uh, charging, charging stations. And, and so that's how we're, we're looking at ways to help these smaller businesses just thrive. Um, and many of those businesses are developing products that will help us reduce our carbon footprint around the world. Mm -hmm. And then on the actual technology side, um, Noel, I know that GM has worked with the U.S. government um, and laboratories like Argonne National Laboratory to develop, like, its battery platform. I'm kind of curious, like, as far as, like, the basic research, the more fundamental stuff, like, where do you think that your company would see some of the biggest dividends? Like, what, what other kinds of ideas are out there that maybe we should be thinking a little bit more about investing in big picture long shots? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, you know, we always uh, focus on our old team platform, which is our... Uh, um, our, our battery uh, system. And uh, the great thing about our battery system is that you can modify it uh, where it can uh, power up a $30,000 car um, or something a little larger, like a Hummer, um, where it can go from 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds. So utilizing that technology, we now um, are in the business of delivering. So the last mile delivery through our Bright Drop company. So this is a delivery service that we have where we build these vehicles, and uh, we've partnered with UPS and Walmart, so they're currently on the road. And uh, this gives another opportunity for of, of every part of your life, not just your own personal driving, but also uh, obviously the commercial aspect. 
Cole, if you were at the table helping shape the U.S. R&D budget, where do you think that we would see some of the biggest uh, dividends if we were to invest in? You mean by industry? I mean, yeah. Like, well, what would you take? I mean, if you were representing your company and they were deciding, you know, at the Department of Energy, you know, or at any other federal agency, like where where should they be investing in that you think might have some of the biggest in, impact on on the work that you do? So I'd say in two areas. One is obviously technology, um, because we know that um, reporting and monitoring your uh, your carbon emissions is, you know, those those areas are really important. I'd also say um, just providing resources to universities um, and maybe credits to companies for apprenticeships. So investing in people. Um, because people need jobs, right? Students need jobs. Students need to be trained in these areas. So uh, investing in schools that produce engineers. Uh, and, and so I think those would be some of those two, two key areas. You're hearing more and more about governments um, modernizing their, in the word is fleet, their, their cars. And they're going to be you know, run on you know, electric vehicles. I don't know if they'll be GM or Ford or what have you, but Tesla, I don't know. Um, so, um, but, uh, <laughs> I know, GM, you want GM. So, um, but, but that requires, you know, the gov- governments will hopefully want to report how it has reduced its carbon footprint, right? It's methane emissions, um, it's, its footprint by transitioning to this fleet. And in order to do that, you have to track the progress. You have to do that with software. You could do it with an Excel chart, but that would be old and antiquated, right? Nothing wrong with Excel. But, um, but if, we're, if we want to become modern, if we want to um, have interoperability amongst agencies, if we want the federal agencies to report its data to you know, the EPA or the Department of Energy, um, and you want that data to, to be aggregated concisely, then you have to do that with modern technology. And so we have to embrace that so that we're actually seeing the progress that we're making. No, that's a great point, and um, I guess maybe I'll put this to you, Julia. Lynn. With this uh, measurement, verification, and reporting, like who are you accountable to, and how do you hold yourselves accountable to these uh, ambitious targets you've set for yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say it's all of our customers and our investors. So obviously, like I said, we set these really ambitious and comprehensive goals around climate, um, around forests, um, Uh, disclosing our greenhouse gas emissions. So it's really important for us to be able to every year disclose and be transparent in that. So we've actually been publishing a sustainable impact report for 21 years, um, which is one of, we were one of the first companies to do it. And every year we have annual and quarterly investor presentations where we talk about our environment, social, and governance metrics. So it's really embedded throughout our um, entire annual and quarterly processes. Um, so it's like something that HP really uh, strives to be transparent and takes very seriously. And how about you, Noel? What, what are some of the benchmarks that you're working with, and how do you keep yourself honest about them? Yeah, just to add on that, the sustainability report, something we do as well. It's public. You can see it. Um, all our metrics, it's widely available, uh, it's quite comprehensive. And, um, you know, same, you know, we obviously communicate quite a bit with our shareholders, public, and, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I've, I've touched on this, it's the right thing to do. But you also look at the big picture. We've announced 2040 being carbon neutral. Uh, we announced 2035 all electric. 2025, um, every U.S. Uh, facility, uh, powered by renewable energy. So these are big targets, um, lots of investments. And look, we're working with the federal government to make sure we get this done through, especially this past Congress, with all the uh, uh, clean energy tax incentives. So uh, we find we find that it is a path for um, to hitting our goals. So we're, we're quite happy. And then finally, When we're dealing with a problem like climate change, that sort of implies that we need to level off and perhaps even decline consumption writ large over time. And that's kind of a tough thing for businesses to deal with who are always lobbying for, you know, or working for larger and larger market share and selling more of their products. And I'm kind of curious, how do you operate in that kind of business environment where potentially your customers might be using less of your stuff? Julia? Yeah. So uh, also another great question. I would say that we really, like I said, we put out these circularity goals and we've embedded 
circular economy principles throughout our research and development and uh, of our new products. So we're trying to design out waste. We're trying to make them more repairable, repairable, more recyclable for our customers to be able to use them for longer and then be able to get the parts that they need to um, use them even longer after that, you know? So it's something that uh, we're working and we take very seriously and understand that that's the future. How about you, Nicole? So I can't say that there is going to be a reduction of the use of technology, right? Um, because we know that these digital transformation tailwinds are strong and the impetus for using technology is it's here. And, and so our mission is to continue making sure that our platform, which is called the Now platform, and you can look it up, follow us, um, so that you can understand all the great things that we're, that we're doing, just making sure that it evolves, making sure that it's nimble, that... Um, um, our app developers can build on it. We announced a program uh, just about two weeks ago called Rise Up so that um, workers, students can get familiar with our platform, learn how to build on it, uh, because there are so many amazing ideas out there that often get ignored or don't have the resources to, to really grow it, and, and so we're doing that. Um, but the, but those, are, those are ways that we want to continue making sure that technology is here to stay, but not at the expense of workers not having jobs. And, you know, those workers who work at plants where they will have to, um, you know, learn to code or learn to do, you know, have a different sort of, of role, just helping them get retrained, reskilled, providing digital skills um, at different universities like San Diego State um, we partner with. And, and those are some of, the way, some of the great things that we're doing. I also want to mention, because of the audience um, here today, um, you know, while companies are really focused on ESG, we can't forget um, about the S part, right? And um, one of the areas that we have been very vocal about is with DACA. Um, and we recently signed a letter advocating for, you know, a, a policy that protects dreamers. And that's part of that ESG. Um, and, and so it's not lost on us that, um, that we need to make sure, as, you know, um, Governor-elect Wes Moore says, that no one is left behind, because if people are left behind, then, as uh, Noel said, these electric vehicles will be hard to purchase. Or communities, all communities won't have, you know, charging stations. So we'll have to scour around looking for them. And, and so for us as a company, it's, you know, our, our motto is that the world works with ServiceNow. And so we believe that that's everyone, you know, in the world. We try to work with everyone. We try to bring people along, um, along with our governments and, you know, business customers as well. Well, anything to add? Of course. Uh, let's see. Uh, so look, General Motors is the largest U.S. car company. Uh, and for those that are in Texas, also the largest Texas car company. Okay. Um, look, at, at the end of the day, GM has been around for over 100 years. And if anyone can survive, it's General Motors. Um, we, when you start thinking about electric vehicles, uh, people tend to forget that they get a little smarter. And an average... Uh, you know, regular vehicle that runs on gasoline has about a thousand chips, semiconductors, and with an electric vehicle, you're doubling that. So it's a whole lot more. You're, you're doubling it to two thousand plus, and we're very fortunate for passing the Chips Act, which is a fifty-two billion dollar bill. Two billion is solely on um, auto wafers, so for uh, semiconductor legacy chips for the auto. So we feel we're also in a good place to build our EV uh, frame. But look, at the end of the day, as I mentioned, uh, we'll find a way, and we're expanding our businesses from, from delivery to uh, you know, GM defense, making sure our, uh, our, our military is operating with electric vehicles to autonomous vehicles. So we feel pretty confident moving forward. This time, we can open the floor to the audience to ask some questions. I don't know if we have microphones floating around, but we do. Uh, please raise your hand, please introduce yourself, and please ask a question, not a statement. Uh, looks like we've got one over here. Hey, uh, my name is David Rodas, and uh, yeah, as, as I was just looking at the, the heading, cleaning up the planet with technology, uh, and in the context of the conversation, it's been quite interesting, right? I mean, obviously, the products uh, need to serve the, the environment, right? Need to, to serve the, uh, the current consumer, but uh, roughly 40% of our carbon emissions here in the United States comes from residential and commercial buildings, 
not necessarily the products that you guys are uh, or y'all that are uh, talking about. So uh, I guess if we really want to clean up the planet with technology for the future, shouldn't that be something that we should be focused on a little bit more? Uh, you know, you talk about opening up plants, opening up buildings, uh, talk about the chips, right? You're going to need plants to, to, to build the chips and build the technology. Um, does your company currently, like, think about the certain kind of, like, existing and emerging technologies that are implemented in commercial buildings as they're being built to make them more sustainable, to make them more clean? Yeah, look, we're, we're, we're retrofitting and, and redesigning a lot of our existing plants and expanding so they can build EVs. As I mentioned, by 2025, all of our facilities here in the U.S. will run on renewable energy. And you make a great point. It's not just uh, you know, the transportation sector. It's also the health sector. They're about 10%. It's also the, the agriculture sector. Um, so it's, you know, the way we see it is we have a tangible pro- uh, product that everyday Americans can use, which is an electric vehicle. Uh, most folks can drive, and most folks can afford these vehicles as well. So we're offering a solution and uh, more than happy to uh, work with other industries uh, to, uh, you know, uh, tackle on this issue. And, and yes, even for us, we are, um, if we're looking to expand into new offices, um, like there's uh, a city that we're getting ready to um, have an office in, and the building is LEED certified. Um, you know, it's a, so it's a green building. So we are absolutely conscious of the space um, that we choose to lease. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, the data centers that we have and the buildings that they are housed in around the world, that's critically important to consider as we're doing that. That's a great point. And when you own your building one day, wherever that is, um, let us know. And, um, and you market to companies that are looking for space you know, that, that you have. And Nicole, you mentioned earlier that like your operations are already 100% renewable energy. So if we shift things that are on ink and paper towards services like yours, presumably we would need less building space overall. Is that, is that part of your calculation? Well, but remember, the data centers yes. are housed in buildings. You know, it took me some time to realize, what is the cloud? You know, and right, the right, kids right. are like, it's in the cloud, right. I saved it. You know? And it's not really like the cloud, right? right, right. But it's, it's, and so these data centers have to be housed Right. In buildings, and so they they should we should all we should strive to have them in green buildings, which means that real estate industry um, commercial real estate industries need to and I'm, I know that they're talking and having conferences about that how do you retrofit your buildings so that they are lead certified and I think that's one role I believe we're all government affairs uh, people on this panel is what our job is to take bills like the Inflation Reduction Act that has provisions for retrofitting. Um, retrofitting offices or commercial buildings, residential buildings, putting in heat pumps, things that are more um, environmentally friendly and having our companies tap into that and use that as a lever to really further progress and um, energy efficiency. The other point I think you were alluding to is just how many jobs can actually take place from home um, so that you're therefore reducing office space. Um, and, and that's important, too. And we learned this after COVID, that you know, we, many of us had to work from home. And how much more did you get done versus were you distracted by your children or the sock that was on the floor on your way to getting some water or something? And um, uh, so there, there is still this um, importance of recognizing that. Can we become more efficient as a company by having some of your employees work from home versus having them occupy, occupy this space? But it doesn't excuse um, the importance of us working together, seeing each other, having human you know, totally. um, interaction, because we are stronger together when we can um, get together and, and work. Um, so there's a balancing um, act that has to take place with that. Uh, here in the front row. Uh, it's for the people who are, or for the recording as well. So, buenas tardes. Um, buenas tardes. I am an educator and an entrepreneur, and I want to piggyback back of what you said because I was looking at the title as myself, and as an educator, I know with COVID, I was able to teach my students about global citizenship. So. I wonder that you guys all come from different companies, right? So 
who is making the standards for what you guys have to save or how you have to like navigate in each of your industry and also um targets in time right so when do you have to meet a certain target like by what time and who in each of your companies goes and tells the community like educating the community because i could care a lot about global climate change that's like a global fight for all of us but if i live in a hood or in a barrio this doesn't really matter to me because i can even afford technology so i i think those are my two questions so like who get who does the dirty work to educate your customers and targets and times who do you guys report to i'll, I'll go i'll go first um So $50 million, dollars, General Motors has put in a fund called the Climate Equity Fund. Uh, we provide grants to nonprofits and organizations around the, uh, the country uh, to make sure that uh, these communities are not left behind. Uh, I was just talking to, uh, um, I was just reading about and understanding a little bit more about one grant, which is uh, taking place in Maryland. Um, so... There is a, an organization based out of Los Angeles uh, called uh, uh, Energy Citizen, and uh, they received a $400,000 grant. They're going into uh, Maryland communities, and they're having bilingual literature, bilingual uh, speakers in primarily Latino neighborhoods to talk to them about electric vehicles and um, how they can adopt, how they can, um, you know, they'll co-opt and whatnot for affordability, but also um, inserting uh, charging stations in those communities. So it is this full-on campaign making sure uh, those, as you mentioned, in Barrio can understand and are fully aware. And that's just one example. Like I said, it's at the current moment, it's $50 million. dollars. We doubled it from $25, our, current annou our, our former announcement to $50. But that's just one project of many where we're trying to tackle and really educate Uh, the communities back home. So um, to answer your first question, governments around the world create standards. So here in the United States, el Congreso, um, the congresistas, and they, they, they are working on creating a law that says, you know, companies um, have to have net zero by a certain year. And the hard part is just finding agreement, which year, because you have all these different industries. You have the coal miners, right? You have the U.S. steels of the world. You have GM. You have all of these different companies have to figure out how can we comply, how much will it cost for us to invest in the technology, retrain the people so that we can meet these Um, these these deadlines, and so then they're lobbying Congress to say, hey, we can't we can't meet you know 2030, but what about 2040 or what about 20, you know? And so you have to have some sort of compromise that takes place. So governments create those laws. You also have organizations like the UN, um, and and then there are nonprofits that create you know guidelines and best practices. So, but it's the government. Governments around the world are creating these laws, and you can read about them. Um, and, and that's how you'll get up to date. But oftentimes you'll find that there hasn't been consensus met yet about wh when these benchmarks should take place. And so in the absence of that consensus, in the absence of those laws, you're seeing com companies just say, we're going to create our own um, goals. And eventually, you know, these governmental bodies will, will, reach, uh, will come to some kind of consensus. Um, the, to your second point, which is critically important, which Noel said, you know, GM has um, a program and ServiceNow has a program. It's our global impact fund where we are investing in communities. We're investing in different programs um, to help educate. You know, through our government relations um, team, we partner with different organizations, um, you know, the uh, Hispanic, uh, with CHCI and um, the, the state legislators as well, um, In HCSL, um, you know, we are at the table where we can actually say, well, let's look at what state legislators are, legislatures are um, thinking about and sharing what we're doing from a technology perspective and how our platforms can help. Um, and, you know, thank God for Larry because he then tells us, I think you need to invest in these organizations so that you're actually reaching people because 
everyday people, like all of us, right? We are focused on getting our kids to school or getting to the gym or getting to work. And you may not know what's happening. Um, and you might get to the gym and find that there's no trash can. Well, why is there no trash can? Because this, you know, the gym has decided to go trash can free. So whatever you have, figure, you know. So, you know, or you have children who say, well, don't put that in this can, put it in this. We need to get blue bags and we need this. And, and so we just, kids are being educated at school. Um, we are being educated at work, um, and we just have to talk and not leave any community behind. Yeah, I think I 100% agree. Our chief sustainability officer, James McCall, always says that we are each climate champion. So in every decision that we make, whether it's the clothes we're buying, is it fast fashion? Are we thinking about sustainability purchases? And for us, it's like when you go to buy a computer, are you thinking about recycled content? Are you thinking about your energy use? Even when you leave a room, are you turning off the lights? And I used to get yelled at all the time by my parents for never turning off the lights. I don't know if anyone else did. But it's really, each of us can make great collective progress by understanding that we have such a role to play individually um, to thinking about how we're going to clean up the planet. I think we've got time for maybe one more question, if it's quick. And uh, I just wanted to add one oh, more please. comment. You know, all of you look so much younger than I am, and so... I just want to impress upon you that when you are in these, with your employer, in whatever role you have, make sure you're speaking up um, because diversity is so important. And when you're at the table, don't shy away from, you know, respectfully educating someone else about r reality, um, which is, as Noel said, you know, not everyone can afford a battery electric vehicle. So I'm sure that Noel is saying, well, let's make sure that we are, you know, making these cars. Now the Corvette, I'm not quite sure how much, you, you didn't quite say how much that would be, but, um, you know, <laughs> how much, will these products be affordable? Will these battery, will these charging stations be in these communities? Okay, with hiring, are we making sure that we're hiring Latinos and, you know, blacks and Asians? Are we at the table? So that when you're at the table, you bring others along, you make sure that you are sharing your viewpoint because that's what diversity is about. Um, because if we don't do that, we'll continue to see more of the same. Um, and look for internships at companies that share the same values. You know, look at companies like ServiceNow, look at GM, you know, look at HP, look everywhere um, so that you are at the table. All right, one final question right here. Um, okay. So. Basically, I want to like I want to start my question uh, with uh, saying that um, I don't like I do not think personally that consum consumption will decrease. I mean, it, it will not in a in a you know in a market that's driven by consumption. It, like we cannot expect corporations to do it. They will lose their profits. They will close, shut down. They wouldn't. Um, simultaneously, we only have one planet. That's it. Like this is it. We destroy it. We're dead. Um, Therefore, like, it becomes a sort of a common uh, responsibility to take care of it, like, regardless whether you're in the private, public, it doesn't matter where you are. Um, and then we have technology, right? Like, and a vast amount of resources, like, we never had it before. Um, we are, like, in this position in which, you know, like, we can turn uh, technology against the destructive forces of capitalism and what, you know, companies uh, have done, uh, mainly with this extractivism, and destruction of the planet. And of course, if we're talking about it, we have to talk about corporate responsibility. And then um, corporate responsibility in that sense is uh, a network of corporations working together and in alignment to sort of uh, counteract the damage that uh, we have done to the planet, right? We don't feel it much in the US, but when you go, uh, for instance, uh, to abroad, I'm not gonna say names of countries, but where the extraction happens, the damage in those communities is horrible. Like you have cancer, people die. It's terrible, okay? So um, why I'm saying all of this uh, leading to my question that like, what are the uh, global efforts of, uh, that you know of? What are the global efforts of corporations are taking on to work together, to learn from each other, uh, to take care from this planet? And um, I just would like to learn more about those collaborations that are happening at that higher level if those exist. So I, I'd love to help answer that. First of all, I think that um, it's really important to have an experience where you are working in a company. Because when you're working in a company, as I mentioned earlier, you 
can lend your voice, um, and then you can actually speak from a place of authority. And so when you are in these spaces, then you can, you can say, like I can say, I work for a company that is committed to reaching these goals. We are already doing that. We are members of different associations where we do collaborate with other companies. Um, I do believe, and we are seeing that consumption is going down. So unless you actually know and see the data, um, it's unfair to say that you don't believe it's going to happen because it is happening. Um, it might not be happening in drastic amounts, right? But every little bit helps. And so our viewpoint about this is important. We're not going to change everything overnight. But any little bit, um, any little role that we can play collectively and within these companies will make a difference. As you mentioned, communities, water, right? If we're looking, think about what happened in Flint. Think about what just happened in Jackson. And so if we're not at the table talking about changing the water system, allocating dollars toward that, um, if we're not conscious about the kinds of water that we're drinking, we've got to be more informed and educated. And again, speaking up in these spaces that we're in, applying for jobs, reaching out to people like us, connect with us on LinkedIn, connect with us on Instagram and any other site, because that's how you learn about opportunities. We can't bring each other along if we don't know if you're interested, if we can't train you and tell you, here's how you show up at your job, here's how you ask questions, here's how you show optimism versus pessimism. Um, and, and that's how we make these changes. Just to piggyback on that, uh Look, GM is, is made up of people like you and me, right? We have 100,000 employees here in the U.S., a um, total of 140,000 around the world. Um, at the end of the day, uh, look, as we go carbon neutral and as uh, not just here in the U.S., but worldwide, uh, we're working with a lot of our suppliers, a lot of our partners. And guess what? As you mentioned, it gets very complicated. Um, and, uh, you know, not just here in the U.S., but, you know, the rest of the continents that we're in. But uh, just to let you know, that plan internally has been in motion for years now. So um, that's our ultimate goal. And um, as you mentioned, it gets a little complex, but, uh, you know, we look forward to it. And we need good people to work at our company. And, um, you know, we need folks like you uh, to, to join. So question. Uh, thank you, Noel, and thank you to our panelists. We're at the end of our time. I just want to say thank you one more time to Noel Perez at GM, Nicole Francis Reynolds at ServiceNow, and Julia Camo at HP. Thank you all for your insight here. I think we've learned here that technology is absolutely necessary for dealing with a problem like climate change, but we need also a business model, accessibility, and education all to make this all very successful. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes uh, for the audience. I just want to emphasize that you can continue tweeting with the hashtag CHCI Summit and share some of your biggest takeaways there. There are going to be three breakout sessions beginning at 2.30 p.m. And then the closing plenary today at 3.45 p.m. called Technology and Building Latino Wealth. Uh, one more time, thank you to the audience and thank you to the panelists and thank you to CHCI for putting this together. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.